mainstream in the information age means a lot of things, a couple of which are near and dear to my heart. One of them is we live with rapidly evolving technology we can barely keep up with, right? Everybody's got a smartphone, I bet. And the other one is we are being inundated with information constantly. Big data, our healthcare data, statistics, political polls, polls of polls. Now, some of it's good, a lot of it's gratuitous, but the fact is, it's overwhelming. Grace Hopper recognized this early on. She was a computer, computer science pioneer, and she recognized that we're flooding people with information, and a human is required to turn that information into intelligence or knowledge. So how do we do that? We visualize it. We put it into a visual form so people can interpret it. I'm talking about data visualization and using computer graphics. But imagery, as you know, can lie. If you care about data visualization, you've probably heard of Edward Tufte. He's written many beautiful books about data visualization, my favorite of which is the visual display of quantitative information. In it, he describes the elements of excellent quantitative displays. What he doesn't do is explain how do you go from a raw data set, your original numbers, and convert them into an image that people can look at and go, I get it. What is that process? I'd been doing this for years, but I never really broke it down. We're all literate here. We can construct a sentence. We have proper grammar. We have a vocabulary. We know how to string words together in a sentence and have people understand us. Some authors elevate this to an art form, and I bet you can think of at least one author that does that for you, where you just savor their words because they do it so well. But you don't have to be a Pulitzer Prize winning author to be literate, do you? You just have to be able to apply the grammar, use the vocabulary for people to understand you. I'd been doing this for a long time as a scientist, taking the research that I'd done and creating images to communicate it. But I never really broke it down. And I wanted to figure this out. So I set about doing this, and I went back and I read all of Tufti's books. I watched TED Talks. If you haven't seen Hans Rosling give a TED Talk, you've got to watch, he's adorable. He's a statistician, and don't let that scare you, he's not boring at all. <laughs> I did more reading, I talked to more people. Sarah Slovin does amazing infographics, I talked to her, I talked to my colleagues. I watched David McCandless' TED Talk, The Beauty of Data Visualization, another one that I highly recommend. And I came up with a process, and I put it into a graduate-level curriculum. But there was part of me that was thinking, did I get everything? Is this all-inclusive? Does it work for all kinds of data? I wasn't really sure. And then I found out that David McCandless was crossing the pond to teach workshops here about his process. I got all excited. Oh, boy. So I went to San Francisco. I went to one of his workshops. And I sat down there in the front row, being the giddy little geek that I am. And I was thrilled when he validated my process. And here it is. <laughs> you start out with your raw numbers. And it can come in, in many numbers of forms. So you've scraped the internet. You've done surveys. You've done research, whatever. You've gathered your raw data. And the first thing you have to do is look at it and say, OK, what is it saying? Sometimes you already know. You have a pretty good idea. And in other cases, you have to look at it six ways from Sunday to figure out what it's trying to say. 
This is where you get intimate with your data. Once you've determined the message, you're gonna render an image. It can be a chart, a graph, an animation, a 3D model, whatever that happens to be that conveys that information. And then you're gonna ask yourself, does that make sense? And you're gonna show it to other people and you're gonna ask them, does this make sense? And if it doesn't, that means you have to go back to the drawing board, look at it again, maybe there's some issues you have to resolve with the original data set, and then you start over and you re-render. If it's almost there, but not quite as clear as you want it to be, then you're gonna go through an iterative process and go back through the design and revise the image step. Once you get it to the point where you look at it and go, yep, that's the message. Other people look at it and go, yep, I get it. That's good. Then you're gonna publish it. Now that means you're gonna put it on the web, you're gonna put it in a peer-reviewed journal, or maybe you're gonna put it in a talk. Now, each of those images is gonna look different because the audience is different. I'm gonna spend the rest of our time talking about the design and revise step of the process. And this is where we bring in what I call the grammar and vocabulary of visual communication. What I'm talking about here is really visual literacy. Now, don't worry. I'm not trying to convince you you need to learn a new skill. Human beings have been communicating with images for eons before we invented language. So we all already know how to do this, and I hope I can convince you of this. Let's look at our world a little bit and how we experience it visually. So here's Yosemite, and does your blood pressure drop just a few points? <laughs> or imagine being in a redwood forest. There have been studies. Stanford did a study a few years back, and they demonstrated that walking in nature would reduce people's stress levels. Tell us something we don't already know. <laughs> okay, I will. More recently, Amsterdam, there was a study in Amsterdam that came out that showed the exact same result, just showing people images of nature. Now that's testimony to the power of imagery. <sighs> now what are you noticing about these images? Mostly blue, lots of green, and then varying shades of grays and browns. This is nature's color palette for all is well with the world. We all recognize it. So what does nature do when it wants to get your attention? Did you at least mentally back up a bit? We all know what that black and yellow combination means. That's nature's synonym for danger. And we already use it to warn people of traffic hazards or radioactivity. Can you think of other examples of color vocabulary that we already use? How about faucets? Red is hot, blue is cold. Traffic lights, red, yellow, and green. Everybody knows what that means, and it's not different for every country. Everybody knows what that means. I bet you can think of other examples, and I hope that when you leave here, you'll start noticing color vocabulary. So let's look at some examples of this applied to data. So here's a Mercator projection. Sea surface temperatures. Now this is my number one pet peeve in terms of visual grammar and vocabulary. What I see in terms of color vocabulary is this. I don't think the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is trying to tell me the ocean is gay. Not that there's anything wrong with that. 
but they're missing an opportunity to be intuitive in terms of the color scheme. So that's the vocabulary issue. The other one I'm going to call a visual grammar issue. Now, first I have to tell you that I'm a card-carrying member of the grammar police to correct and serve. <laughs> there are two visual grammar issues going on here. You probably all have your pet peeves too, right? Two issues here. One is the person who rendered this, if they were writing a sentence, it would be the equivalent of taking all the letters of the alphabet and putting them in that image and putting them in, in all caps. That image is screaming at you. The other reason that it's my number one grammar pet peeve is because they map their data range to the fully saturated rainbow. Okay, so that already we have the vocabulary issue, but now they have this data range with two fixed endpoints. That's the range that the data is for that particular data set. Suppose they collect the data next year, the range might change and the colors might pertain to different temperatures. And now if I compare two maps side by side that were made the same way, it's like comparing apples to oranges. So if I were to fix this, I would do two things. I'd change the color vocabulary and I'd use blue for the cooler temperatures, red for the warmer temperatures. I'd pick a color map range of data that's going to include all the possible numbers that you could get if you repeated this experiment year after year and use that every year. That way you can look at it every year and compare them and even look at how it changes over time. Let's look at another example. This is the digital elevation map for Colorado. And in this particular form, it's hard to make out, are you looking at peaks or valleys? What's going on here? If you know what Colorado looks like, you already know, but coloring it will help. And a geologist would color it with the fully saturated rainbow. Now you can tell where the low red area is and it goes up through all the colors up to the purple peaks. So now the elevations are clear, but it's not intuitive. And that same geologist would take the digital elevation map for Kansas and map the full rainbow to it. So the places in Kansas that are purple are not going to be as high as the place in Colorado that's purple. So what do we do? What was the right way to do it? Cartographers have this figured out. You recognize this color map? This is nature's color palette. And it's intuitive. The peaks are white where the snow is. And when the cartographer applies his map to Kansas, there isn't going to be white there because that elevation isn't in Kansas. Okay, I have 167 more examples to show you. <laughs> but I know I better wrap this up. So we've been told there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. But actually, I'm here to tell you there are four kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, statistics, and computer graphics. With computers right now, we have a whole new way to lie. The most obvious example is in the movies, special effects, right? What used to take huge budgets to do stunts and create creatures, we can now do on a computer screen. Amazing. Now, I'm fine with suspending disbelief for my entertainment. Go ahead, lie to me if I'm at the movies. But I draw the line at data visualization. We have to be faithful to, to the data, to be clear, to be accurate. If you use this power of imagery for evil, I will hunt you down. I will find you. 